You're listening to Business Extra coming from the Nationals Newsroom in Abu Dhabi. I'm your host, Kelsey Warner. I'm joined today by a great guest for the times we're in. Those would be boom times for UAE real estate. Yes, I'm talking in part about that record-breaking $34 million plot of sand that was sold in Dubai last month, and a more cautious moment for tech. Riding the line of property and tech is Property Finder, the Dubai-based property portal that I think is safe to say at 18 years old and with a presence in over a half dozen markets is no longer really a startup. And I'm joined today by its founder and CEO, Michael Liani. Michael, hi. Thanks for being here. Hi. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. Good to see you. And so I referenced at the top the $34 million plot of sand that got sold, made headlines. It's a frothy, exuberant time to be in real estate. What what is going on? We seem to be going up and up and up right now. Yeah, I think what's really exciting here in this transaction is uh, this is kind of the first time we're seeing plots being sold at this price um, by end users, right? So this is not a developer that's buying it to develop and then resell units. It's actually somebody who's probably buying it to build his own home. And, and, and that is just speaking to the maturity of the real estate markets, that people are no longer just looking for ready to move houses, but they're willing to buy plots and, uh, and build their own, uh, their own home. Um, so exciting times. I think, uh, you know, the, I, as I always refer to, I say the music keeps on playing. The and, music uh, keeps on playing. Okay. And we hope it doesn't stop. <laughs> <laughs> but you've been around when the music has stopped before, right? You were at the helm of, you founded Property Finder. You know, as I said, 18 years ago, it was a time when the market was way down. Um, you've, you've been there for the slump. This is certainly a market recovery post-pandemic. How would you characterize actually the moment that we're in right now? Is it, is it a little preposterous? Is it safe? What's happening? First of all, it's important to state the obvious, which is real estate markets are cyclical by nature, right? So there's nothing unusual in what we're seeing right now. Real estate markets all around the globe uh, go up and then correct and then go up again. Um, and, and, and that's what creates opportunity. And that's what's so exciting about the real estate market. Um, over the past 18 years that uh, you know we've been in business here with Property Finder, uh, we've seen a lot of booms and we've seen a lot of corrections. Uh, but every time, I would say the correction is a little bit less uh, steep, mm-hmm. right? Um, and, and it looks more like a correction than it is a, a, a big fall. What we're witnessing right now is um, something absolutely unique. I have never seen this in the past 18 years, right? I haven't seen that kind of uh, um, increased international demand for the UAE market. And, and that really a trigger happened in, in the global brand, I would say, of the UAE and Dubai and Abu Dhabi as well. Um, there is a really a switch in, in, in people's mind and, and people are looking up to the UAE and, and, and people are seeing the UAE as a safe ground to invest, to uh, spend more time, to eventually move at some point. And, and, and that is uh, a true change uh, that hasn't happened before. The pricing environment we're in right now is seemingly really unique. So in the luxury real estate market in particular in Dubai, sales recorded in 2022 last year were more than the total recorded between 2010 and 2020 total. So a decade's worth of sales value done in a single year. That's according to data from Knight Frank, and you're nodding, so you're agreeing with that data. That's wild. So there's new precedents, there's new records being set all the time now in the UAE for real estate values. So we're, we're, there's this, this is a step change for, for pricing, right? Absolutely. So look, what's 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 good about those numbers is that it's not just linked or led by price increase. It's also led by volume increase, right? Uh, so the number of transactions, if you compare the number of transactions in 2022, they are also uh, larger than if you add uh, 2020 and 2021, right? Um, so there's a lot more transactions happening, and, and that's also led by a lot more launches happening. So there is massive international demand coming. There is not enough uh, properties available on the market. And so what does you know developers do? What does businessmen do? They go, they buy plots, and they build more because there is more demand. Uh, now, it's also important to recognize that when we announce those numbers or when those numbers are announced, right? they take the full value of a new project, right? 
But when somebody buys a new project or an, a, an apartment off plan, he only puts down 10, 20, 30 percent, right? Uh, he will be paying uh, uh, this property for the next three, four, five years, right? So At least, yeah. The, the total amount is record is registered today, right? But is actually being paid over a number of years. So that value will be realized over the coming half decade, 10 years into, into the economy. Exactly. In terms of the supply side and that correction, are you seeing supply flooding the market a bit more? Because this does get into an affordability issue for, for just an operational middle class in the UAE. Absolutely. And, you know, that's a concern also from, from the authorities, right, from the government. I mean, we... The, the ultimate plan of D33 is to increase the population of, of Dubai, right? And to reach 5.6 million by 2033. Now, if you want to reach this number of population, you can't reach it with only people that are buying plots at $34 million, right? You got to have uh, affordable and attractive real estate for people to be moving into the city. So mm-hmm. when there's a bit of a short squeeze, as I would call it, right? that is happening right now, where in a particular sector, there's not enough supply and therefore the prices are shooting up, right? Um, it's it's not something that uh, is sustainable for, for uh, an extremely long period of time. Hopefully supply will come and hit and will alleviate a little bit of that uh, short squeeze. And, and, and we don't want real estate prices to be excessive, right? We need to be, we need to remain affordable. That's what has made Dubai's strength, I would say, compared to all the big global cities, is that, hey, you get amazing quality of life at an affordable price. Um, and, and, and we want it to remain that way. Um, yes, prices have gone up, but they haven't gone up that dramatically in the mid-segment as much as on the old, on the on the luxury segment. So there is really a short supply on the high-end luxury segment. And that's what you see making the headlines most of the time. If you take, you know, the mid segments, uh, prices have increased, but, you know, they haven't two, three X like you, like they have in the high end segment. Okay. That's interesting. So the brand of the UAE is really speaking to a high net worth individual in a lot of ways right now, but things are a little bit more business as usual in the, in the mid tier. Yes, indeed. I think this is really where, 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 you know, the UAE has become an attractive place uh, more than in the past for those high net worth individuals. Uh, or maybe we can say other places in the world has been, you know, less welcoming to these right. people. So the unspoken thing here now, yeah, is the Russian money pouring in at the, at the current moment, right? Yes. So there is, there is that, right? There's obviously, we, you know, no secrets that the Russians have been coming uh, to, the, to, to, to the UAE because, you know, they're feeling a lot more welcome here than they are anywhere else in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's important also to state that, you know, the, the, the sustained prices that we're seeing or the sustained demand that we're seeing for, uh, for real estate is not just led by those newcomers. It's also led by a shift of mentality of the residents of the UAE who for the longest time have been living in the UAE renting and very comfortable with the idea of renting because rent were stables and, 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 you know, um, people didn't have a 10 year horizon uh, living in the UAE. And so why do I need to buy if I don't know if I'm going to be here in 10 years? Now, all these residents are now, you know, many of these residents have now been given golden visa, right? So suddenly you're not looking three year ahead, but you're looking 10 year ahead. And then you think, okay, well, am I going to be here in 10 years? Am I going to go home? And then you kind of look where home is, wherever that is. And, you know, (laughs) yes, as of today, you Mm -hmm. know, most homes don't look that attractive, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, going through struggles and and, and politics are involved and and security is involved and for all those reasons. And so people are like, look, I'm going to be staying in the UAE. And if I'm going to be staying in the UAE and prices are going up because there is demand coming from international Maybe I should think about buying rather now than, than later. And so a lot of the transactions are done by people that are already residents and becoming owners. I think the Golden Visa is one of the kind of unsung heroes as an artifact of our post-pandemic times. Would you say that? Is the Golden Visa kind of a, really a game changer? Totally. 100%. Right? Because it's very hard to tell to somebody, hey, why don't you buy real estate in the UAE? But you know what? We don't know if we're going to be able to renew your visa in three years. Actually, we will renew it, but you know, there's always a possibility that it doesn't get renewed. 
well, hang on, why should I buy then? Let me keep on renting and renting. The minute I have, you know, a, a confirmation that I'm going to be here for 10 years, that gives me enough horizon to be a real estate, uh, to be an owner, property owner. So absolutely, that has been game changer. And, 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 um, and, and I think it's resonated really well with the international communities. And do you think we will continue to see uptake of the golden visa in the years ahead? It's not a one-off novel thing for the first couple of years that maybe burns off? Yeah, the UAE government is looking to distribute a lot more golden visas, right? They want to attract technologists. They want to attract sportsmen. They want to attract artists. They want to attract scientists. Uh, they're just getting started, right, with that golden visa. Uh, it's working, and uh, they will continue to be giving out golden visas to whoever uh, deserves it. Uh, the process is being uh, ironed out as well, and it's a lot easier. There's a lot more clarity on what you need to do and how to get it. And it's no longer, oh, I know somebody that can get me a golden visa. <laughs> right. There's a clear you know, guidelines on how to, how to get a golden visa. And, and a lot of people are eligible to that golden visa. So yes, absolutely. That will continue to sustain the demand. A little more than a year ago, you acquired Dubai-based Home Value, and its founder and CEO was tapped to become the VP in charge of data and AI at Property Finder. I was wondering if you could just provide an update for us on that acquisition and what that has done for your business. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, there's... Um, uh, there are things that we can develop internally at Property Finder, uh, but when it comes to very, um, I would say, uh, technology-driven, AI-driven, data-driven products, uh, sometimes we look at uh, acquiring these talents, right? And uh, those talents are usually founders, and we go out and we acquire a company and bring in the founder and, uh, and, 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 and give him a larger role inside the organization that enables to trickle innovation uh, inside uh, a corporation. Um, and so Fuad had joined us, uh, I think now uh, over a year and a half ago. And uh, all the data points that we're seeing on our property listing page, uh, where there are uh, trends on prices, transacted prices, average uh, rental expected, there's a, a lot of data points, delivery of a project, uh, uh, service charges, um, interest points and all of that. Uh, this is a project that is led by uh, by Fuad. And what we're seeing is that time spent from our users on those pages is increasing because of the data that we're now publishing and making available to our uh, to our users. So 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 people are consuming this data. People are thirsty for data in uh, in our part of the world. They've been lacking data. They uh, reliable data. And um, and as you know, data and transparency is the bedrock of trust. And and trust is what is needed in order for somebody to do a trade, for somebody to invest. Right, for so, somebody uh, to make the biggest purchase of their life. Exactly. They need to trust that, you know, the data that they're relying their decision on is uh, trustworthy and uh, and accurate. So in terms of AI is certainly the topic du jour, but in terms of what you guys are playing into in this space, what are your focus areas? You mentioned some data points, but really what are you, you know, pressing the gas pedal on in terms of your AI machine? Where are you focused? So it, it's no secret that, that users who are searching or on, uh, are in the market for property will get frustrated by, uh, you know, what people call... Uh, broadly fake listings, right? Now, fake listings is something that, you know, we're not ashamed of talking about and we're tackling head front. Um, and that we started by defining what does fake listing mean? Is it a total fake listing? Is it a bait listing? Meaning an agent posting a listing that absolutely doesn't exist just to get a lead and then go and monetize that lead with another agent, right? Or, you know, what most people call fake listings are not really fake listings. They are duplicate listings, meaning it's a listing that is published by three different brokers because the owner has the right to choose more than one broker that they want to give their listing to. And then these brokers end up all advertising that listing, right? Um, there's going to be uh, an availability challenge because if three listings are advertised at the same time, how do you know that you know it's available? Because at the same time, it could be in transaction by two other, um, two other brokers. So we use AI here to um, help us uh, guide the users, or I would say uh, do a better job at algorithm and, and push the top quality listings at the top of the search, 
right? And so our looks at hundreds of data points, right? And it's not perfect, right? Like any AI, and it gets perfected with time. And the more people use it, and the more it gets, uh, it gets smarter. Um, but we use AIs in in uh, in our. Uh, uh, you probably saw this new brand that we've launched. This new tag called Super Agents, right? And these are agents that are extremely responsive to their users that uh, have a history of transacting that don't have any properties being reported, those super agents will tend to rank higher than other agents. And the super agent tag is actually given by our AI, which we call Ada, uh, which is which was the first scientist woman that invented actually uh, AI about a century ago. Um, and, and so Ada looks at hundreds of data points and, uh, and then uh, you know, boosts a certain listing based on the quality of the listing. So quality control is a huge focus for you and your AI engine right now. Massive, massive, massive. Quality control and ensuring that uh, the best real estate agents, because obviously, you know, a real estate market like the one that we're in, who's doubled and tripled over the last two, three years, have attracted a lot of new brokers, brokers who've flown in from all around the world to come in here and, you know, make a good living out of uh, real estate brokerage. It's a great business to be in. But obviously, when you attract you know so many new brokers, you know we went from two thousand agencies in the country to four thousand five hundred agencies in in, in 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 the country in in the last of two years. Um, you know, not all real estate brokers are what we like to define as professional, reliable, and trustworthy brokers. It's like in any industry, right? There's a little bit of of, of everything. And so our job is to make sure that those that are reliable and trustworthy stand out, right? And, and, and that we drive our users to those brokers rather than to the other brokers that are here today, but might not be here tomorrow uh, when the market you know, slows down. Um, so, so, so massive focus on quality of the listings and also um, the professionalism of the real estate agents. Right. Uh, and we play that role about setting the standards and we take that you know, role very seriously. At point. The last time we really heard from you guys was when you raised one hundred and twenty million dollars in 2018, led by equity investor General Atlantic, a really well-respected investor from New York. And at the time you were saying we're going to double down on our region. This is about expanding within the region. I'm going to grow headcount by 200. Nobody could have predicted 18 months later the pandemic would happen and kind of reshape a lot of businesses. But can you talk to me a little bit about kind of that time after 2018 going into the pandemic and what the experience was like at the helm of a company you've been leading for a long time and, and how that chapter was for you? Look, we were fortunate to be able to attract one of the you know, top-notch investors of uh, the tech sector, uh, as you mentioned, General Atlantic. And why I say fortunate, it's because first of all, it was you know uh, they haven't they hadn't done a lot of investment in the region, um, and a savvy investor is really key in tough times. Why? Because a savvy investors remain calm during difficult times. They don't panic, and they are there and they're supportive, and um, and they connect you with other leaders that have gone through crisis in order to make sure that you can uh, uh, manage the crisis uh, well. Uh, obviously, there was a you know short moment during COVID where we had absolutely no visibility, where real estate agents were not able to do viewings, and where you know quite frankly the industry everybody panicked a little bit and and said, well, how are we going to make an earning? And the brokers sort of d- turned their backs on you a bit. I know in that moment of uncertainty, there was backlash on the portals for are they doing enough? They need to be helping us more. Let me let me clear a little bit the narrative on that. I don't think they turned our back on us. I think, you know, maybe the media loved that story saying that the brokers turned their back on Property Finder. Uh, I think that what they said is, hey, help us out. We have no visibility. Let's get, you know, let's let's get on a call and let's hash this through. And please tell us what you can do for us because we've been your loyal customers for many years. And right now we're not doing book, we're not doing viewings and we're not, you know, cashing in commissions. So we need some sort of relief on the on, on the subscription. And we did just that. We went on a Zoom call with a couple of like, you know, the top leading agencies. And we agreed. And we agreed that we we're going to give them a break of their subscriptions. And we ended up giving, you know, two months for free um, on of listings. So for two months, we had no revenues at Property Finder because we literally gave a free subscription to all the real estate agents. And 
you know, for most part, they were happy with uh, with that gesture, right? Because it's important to to know that you know, in tough times, we are you know, we're here with them in, in good and in bad times, and we're here and supportive. Obviously, there's always a small number of agents that would want more, right? But we also have a, a PNL to run, and mm-hmm. the truth is, you know, we're running it. You know, we are operating in a market where we didn't have other aids, right? And we have, you know, at that time, we had 400 employees at Property Finder. And so you're going with no visibility and cutting your revenues and you have to sustain costs, right? For for, for those two months where there's no revenue, that creates a little bit of a, of a, of a hole. So, uh, you know, we went through this difficult phase where we had to make some tough decisions, right? And uh, restructure uh, some part of the organization to be leaner so that we could uh, pass on this uh, uh, cost saving to our customers so that they could survive during uh, this uh, uh, this uncertain times. There was a bit of a spree during the pandemic with hiring. You actually, you did contract. You did, yes. you did do layoffs. Yes. So we did. Uh, so that was right during the, 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 the COVID, right? We had to let go maybe, I would say, 10% of our, of our workforce, 10, 15% of our workforce, which is significant. Probably one of the toughest time as a leader, as a founder, is uh, to let go people that you know you wish you could keep, but because uh, there are so much uncertainty, um, you need to do what's right in order to make sure that the entire ship survives. Otherwise, everybody sinks with it. Um, but luckily, and fortunately for us and for the real estate industry, uh, that period didn't last too long. And as Dubai does. Uh, Dubai never misses out on a, on a crisis and knows how to rebound and become and come back stronger. Um, and, and, and that's exactly what we saw, right? Uh, not, you know, the, 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 the whole world was in lockdown and Dubai was uh, already booming. So, you know, the first, the lockdowns happened in, in March, 2020, lasted for a couple of weeks. And uh, uh, in Q4 of that same year, uh, we started seeing pent up demand. So initially we thought, okay, that's, you know, just demand that couldn't transact during the lockdown days that is coming back to the market. But because Dubai stayed open, the entire world started saying, well, let me go and spend my winter in Dubai. It's actually the only place you can go and have a nice dinner and, 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 and still meet people, you know, responsibly in a limited number of people, but you're not locked into your place. And so the market rebounded very quickly and all our customers ended up, you know, back in business, you know, four weeks after the lockdown. So we ended up giving them two months uh, 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 free, but they got back into business much earlier than that. And, you know, uh, uh, we were, you know, very happy to have been able to be there during those tough times. I hope uh, they appreciate that because it did cost us, uh, you know, some. Uh, yeah, it cost you dearly. So now e commerce giant Noon is cutting 10% of its staff. Katapi, which is a cloud kitchen company based in Dubai, cutting 10% of its staff. Tech is sort of in a market correction. We're still amid, you know, that narrative, I suppose. Um, how is it for Property Finder? Did you guys go through that acute pain already? Or are you in that cycle now too? So look, I think one of the things that we did right uh, post-COVID was that when there was this you know, flow of money because of the interest rates being so low and the U.S. printing money uh, and that uh, everybody was throwing money at the tech sector in 2021 and that it was relatively easy to raise money if you were a tech company. We decided that, you know what, let's not go and raise money because we've just made the hard, some hard decisions. We don't want to go into uh, that crazy spending mode. We actually want to grow, but grow responsibly because you know we believe that it's important to be a profitable company and not depend on investors in order to sustain the business. And so in 2021, we you know we made those we we grew and grew super well because the market was there, but we didn't go into overspending, and so we became profitable. Um, and 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 in 2022, when eventually. The funding of all the tech startup dried up and everybody is now looking at cutting their costs. We happen to not be in that position because we've made those hard decisions in, 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 in during COVID times and we didn't go into that hiring spree post-COVID. And uh, we're now, you know, profitable, cash flow positive, and independent from having to fundraise again. 
And uh, and for a tech company, that's a great place to be. So you're independent of having to fundraise again, you say. And at the time of the 2018 headlines, you were saying, now is not the time to IPO. Once again, we're sitting here. Now's a weird time to IPO. Is there ever going to be a right time for Property Finder to go public? What's the purpose of going public? You go public if you need to raise funds at a valuation that the private market is not willing to pay you, right? So you're going to go to the public market because maybe they're a little bit more generous with their with their with their valuations. Or the second reason to IPO is, you know, one of your shareholders wants liquidity, wants out, the other doesn't want liquidity. So at least when the company is public, whoever wants to sell can sell. You can sell down some. You don't need to sell down everything. We're fortunate that we are in none of those two positions. A, we don't need to fundraise, right? So valuation, private or public, doesn't really matter right now because we're not in a fundraising mode. Second, our investors are very happy to continue to be shareholder in the company and are not looking for liquidity immediately. So there's no real reason to IPO. I mean, IPO is a, is a painful process, right? A, it takes a lot of the focus from the entire management team during the IPO year. And then an IPO is only the start of a journey, right? What, you know, making a successful IPO is, 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 is only, you know, chapter one, and there's many chapters to a public life company. And so you need to make sure that you're trading well after that. And so, um, there, you know, you want to have the right scale before you IPO. Most company and what we've seen during the pandemic or during the post pandemic, all these tech companies IPO'd in the US or even here or in, in in all the stock markets around the world, for a matter of fact, but the US mm-hmm. was definitely a lot of tech companies went. And they were, most of them were subscale, right? Uh, and, and the worst thing for a company to be public is to be subscale, too small. Right. And so yeah, they were subscale and also they didn't have the fiscal discipline to actually be worth what they, the markets were saying yeah. that they were worth at a certain time. Airbnb, though, is a good outlier of that. They actually do have some level of market discipline and the markets have rewarded them. They've stayed relatively flat throughout this time of volatility. Do you think, given the story you just told of Property Finder's relative stability right now, that you could mimic that success? We could. Uh, do, we, do we need you to do it now? You just don't want to. You just don't need to. We don't need, we don't need to do it now. Uh, we, so two things we want to make sure that we have, and, and I think we have one of them. We don't have the second one. Two things we want to have. We want to, we want to have scale, right? So, you know, if you're... A, you know, it's great to be a unicorn. It's that whole headline. You're a unicorn. You're a one billion dollar company. But when you're a one billion dollar public company, you're a small cap, right? You're you're on the smaller end size. It's great if it's a big company when you're private. It's a tiny company when you're public, right? If you're going to be public, you want to be a multi billion dollar company because if you're not a multi billion dollar company, the portion of what you put out for the public market is too small, and there's no liquidity in your shares. And that's why, you know, you've got some funny prices on, on, on I'm not going to get too technical, but you need scale and you need profitability, especially these days, right? So, you know, investors are a little bit like, uh, it's a little bit like a fashion, right? There's years where it's fashionable to be high growth and non-profitable and investors just want that, right? And if you're a profitable company, you're a boring company, we're not interested. But one day that fashion changes and it goes switch overnight. We want to be a profitable company. And all the high growth and not profitable company are, you know, being killed on the, on the stock market. So the safe place is to go public when you're profitable, right? That, that is definitely something that all public investors understand is profitability. And so we have that now. So we can go public as a profitable company. But we think that, you know, we can gain more scale before we do that, right? And we can continue growing privately and without having to be uh, on, on, the, on the world stage uh, of, uh, of, uh, of a stock market. Michael Ayani, fun to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure speaking to you too.